All right, so I'm sitting here with, with Dr. Jordan Peterson. We were going to talk about the weird overlap between our books. There's a sort of metafiction aspect of it because Jordan had written the rules for life. It was a Quora entry, yep. right? It's 42 rules in, on Quora, that's right. 42 rules got pared down, so there's going to mm -hmm. be like 19 sequels. Right, that's just right. Just keep rolling them out. And, um, and I thought they were amazing. And so I was writing Orphan X. I was writing the, the, the first book in, in the series. And in Orphan X, my main character is an assassin and he has these sort of 10 commandments that are the operational rules for an assassin. And I wanted something to offset that uh, for a, a, a kid who's in his life who lives downstairs from him who's being raised as a good human instead of as an assassin. And I wanted a set of rules that would kind of counterbalance that. And at the time, I was reading Jordan's uh, rules that he'd listed. And so I sort of used those as a counterbalance as sort of a positive masculinity to use to use the, the use a horrible phrase the, the well-trodden <laughs> term but to actually show how somebody might be raised properly instead of as an international assassin and at the time you know you were a mirror professor at U Toronto mm -hmm. I thought what could possibly be controversial about this yeah right <laughs> and so so that's how it sort of started yeah well it was fun to see you know when you create something like those rules I, I wrote them for Quora and I'd, I'd written like 50 Quora answers and some of them got disproportionately popular, which is mm -hmm. exactly what you'd expect because some things get disproportionately popular. And, and the Quora rules attracted a lot of attention by Quora standards or by the standards of what I was writing on Quora. And then you would you pick them up. And I thought it's it, one of the things that's very interesting about doing something creatively is that you sort of launch it like you launch a note in a bottle on the ocean and you have no idea where it's going to end up. And so that was the first interesting manifestation of those rules outside of the Quora container, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, part of our discussion about the rules also led to their encapsulation in 12 Rules for Life, and that was much later. And it's been interesting to see how that overlap has developed as well. So. Well, it's also weird to see what connects. Like, it's so funny with, with Orphan Acts when I was first adapting it. The big thing with that is that my character kind of interacts He's an archetypal character like a Jack Reacher or Jason Bourne, but lives in the real world with you and me. You know, so it's like he's not, you never see James Bond go home. You never Which is see what an archetypal character should do, right? It, it should exist yeah. in abstraction and also be Im embedded in the real world. Yeah, but usually you have like the high plains drifter who's yeah. like off feeding his horse and like moving on to the next town. Yeah. So I thought it'd be so fun to have him like interacting with the annoying Jewish woman who lives upstairs and having an awkward confrontation with the woman who lives downstairs who mm -hmm. he has chemistry with. So it's mm -hmm. an archetypal character wrestled into the real world. And that's what the Spider-Man people did really well, the Marvel. When exactly. When they invented Spider-Man, they exactly. did that extraordinarily well. Where he has to like re-stitch his costume. Yeah. Like no one thought yeah. about that, you yeah. know, and he's like late for school and all those problems. Exactly, exactly. So that was that was sort of the motif. Um, well, but, that is also the problem of, of it's, a, it's a more complex psychological problem of, of integrating the archetypal with the real world because there's an element of everyone's psyche that's that's transpersonal that's archetypal mm -hmm. right because to some degree you should manifest the mythological hero in your life but the the critical issue there is in your life right, right. because your life is like your life is like the the bottle that or the lamp that the genie is in mm. it's like the genie is god for all intents mm -hmm. and purposes mm -hmm. But it's in this little tiny container. It's like, well, that's what you're like, because you have this archetypal element to your personality, which is your capacity for heroic endeavor. But it's all constrained by the hypothetical or the trivialities of your life. And you, right. have to, you have to mediate between those. Well, and that's the weird thing. Like you were saying, one of the things when you write is you don't always know what's going to connect, right? You never knew that those rules would become, you know, number one best-selling book everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. What was so interesting is there's this one scene at the opening of Orphan X where he's in the elevator and he's got a cut on his arm. We don't know what it's from. And he has to fake to kind of pass as a real person among all the people. And he's kind of covering it up, but he's got suppressors and he used a sock as a tourniquet, so he's missing a sock. And he's kind of trying to pass his secret identity among other people. That scene connected unbelievably hmm. with readers with it. And it would, it would be like the last scene that I would have thought. And when I, I adapted the book initially for Bradley Cooper as a feature. And I remember I was like, well, if I have Bradley Cooper, let me open with some big action-y, show-off-y thing. Mm -hmm. 
And both his production company and the head of the studio were like, we need the elevator scene. Like this elevator scene became the iconic thing, of course, because it does what you're talking about. There should about. be some music playing in the background. Yeah, exactly. Too, so like, there is, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Girl something from re- Ipanema. Yeah, yeah, something per- per- something per- awful. Perfect, perfect yeah. yeah. If you get caught between the moon and New York City. Right, right. But it's weird because I never would have thought that would be the thing. Mm-hmm. So the stuff that you send out do you have any idea why that was so attractive to people? Well, I think it's exactly the thing that we were talking about is like you don't see James Bond in that circumstance. Mm-hmm. It's it's so it's like this archetypal guy has a mission, he has a knife cut that he tourniquets his arm with and then he's in the elevator that you and I've been in and everyone's yeah. nagging him that he's, you know, missed the HOA meeting, the homeowners association meeting where they're voting on like the new carpeting in the lobby and he's just trying to get out of it and he's covering. So there's this wish fulfillment fantasy aspect to it. But it's almost like our own lives and like everyone knows what it's like to be dealing with annoyances and logistics. Mm -hmm. But then he gets to go back to his life as like a super secret assassin who helps the helpless. Well, and there's another element of it, too, I would say, which is that 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 scene and and that that context also suggests that one of the ways that you one of the things that you have to do in order to put up with those mundane daily elements of life is also to have your adventure along with you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, one of the things that I've been talking to my audiences about continually is that you need to have a meaning in your life that's of sufficient grandeur, let's say, or sufficient power, so that the petty sufferings of life yeah. become not only justifiable but acceptable in the broader context. And so, and sufficient risk, mm-hmm, and sufficient risk, because yeah. well, that and that and that's what puts the adventure into it, right? Mm-hmm. It's like in the elevator scene, it's it's not only that everyone can relate to the mundane, it's also that everyone can see that what transcends the mundane is also fundamentally necessary. Because right. otherwise you are nothing but a collection of trivialities. And and life has so much suffering that if you're just a collection of trivialities, you're not going to be able to bear it. So you need your heroic adventure, which is what's animating you. Literally, anima yeah. is the soul, right? That's what anima means. So that's literally animating you while you have to put up with being trapped in this little tiny container. Right, right. I thought about this a lot when I was writing Batman. I wrote Batman for two years for DC. And I was fascinated by the sort of seesaw tilt between perfection and intimacy, which is so Batman, you know, he doesn't have a magic ring. He can't fly. He just represents the pinnacle of human discipline and achievement. It's because his parents died when he was young, right? He's alone in Wayne Manor. There's Robin always dies. There's always a Robin and he dies. He's a playboy. He doesn't have anyone intimate. And if there's no one in your life, you can maintain perfection. But the more you inch into intimacy, Mm -hmm. a dog, a spouse, a partner, children, the more that you get this sort of conflict and complication that starts to take over and detract from that version of perfection. So it's like you can be perfect without intimacy, but then you're not perfect because you have no intimacy. Mm. And so the more that you integrate it, it's almost like the more that you're accepting the realities of life. Mm. Well, and also, I think it's also one of the things, it's interesting in the Batman reference, because one of the things you see in the Batman Joker dynamic, Mm. especially the one with Heath, Heath Ledger, was the Joker was always pushing at Batman because of the evil of his perfections, like you're this far away from me. Mm-hmm. And that perfectionistic drive, there's something totalitarian and single-minded about it, right? And then it's the encapsulation of that in intimacy that that humanizes it and right. keeps it sane. Right. And so, so that unidimensional perfection can go very, very badly when it goes. And to be contextually constrained like that is actually like a definition of sanity. It's something that Jung talked about when he was commenting on Nietzsche. And, and people like Nietzsche, is that he, he believed that Nietzsche would have been able to maintain his sanity for much longer, assuming no physiological degeneration, had he been able to incorporate himself within a profession and a family. It sort right. of nailed him to the earth, right. you know, in, more, in a healthy more, way. More stilts down in the That's ground. right, that's yeah. exactly right. So, I thought we'd just talk briefly about um, the editing process for 12 Rules, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun, because I got mm-hmm. to read it all early, which was yes. which was fun, so I had it featured in the Orphan X books like two years before it came out. Right, Which right. is why I always like to remind you that I'm mostly responsible for your success. Yes, well, and I do yeah, appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Well, I sent all the chapters to Greg. I, I had an editor at Penguin, Craig Payet, who was very, very helpful. So I had two editors, really, and, and other people commenting on it, but I sent each chapter to, to Greg, and he would just shred them. He's really, really good at that. And, <laughs> and it, well, and very comical, and so he'd just be absolutely brutal in his criticisms, <laughs> but it was also, also always extremely funny. It was affectionate. Also, yeah, well, and, and I was also absolutely staggered by how rapidly you could do that, and, and to point to what was working, and to tell me what wasn't working, and so that was exceptionally helpful, and you're very, very skilled at that, so 
So there's the compliment you're going to get from right. me. Now, so it was, now, so it's very now helpful. there's now the insult. First yeah. you lead, you soften me up with the compliment, and now, you know, But I think what was helpful is so. I mean, I took three courses from you as an undergraduate. Yeah. So it's like we've been swimming in the same yeah, waters yeah. for a long time. So it was really interesting for me to see, you know, through the process, um, you know. I have, a, I have a sense that goes kind of all the way down of the ideas you're playing yeah, with, going yeah. back to before Maps of Meaning, right? Yeah. Going back to the source book articles and stuff you lectured yeah. about. So it was really fun to see them take hold and move from the abstract into the ever more accessible and specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, it was useful too because you're, you're, you've developed this intense skill in, in producing com commercial, widely publicly accessible fiction and, and you have a sense of what works in terms of narrative flow, and that was very useful to have that perspective on the way the the, the stories were laid out in in each of the rules mm. to make them to give them that narrative punch, which is necessary to to add an additional dimension of what would you say quality to the writing. So that well, was extremely it's, it's, helpful. It's, I'm glad, but it's it's good working with someone with like your learning curve was like this. So it was like the first one that we went through, you know, if there was something that I, the, the speed with which you could sort of implement and assimilate new information mm. and, and reflect that in writing is unbelievable. Yeah, well, that's fun. But it's a benefit of being sort of experienced in multiple dominant mm. hierarchies, yeah. I think, because yeah. there's so many things that you've done at such a high level that when you add a new one, the learning curve is like this. So it was also really fun because it's like, you know, if well, we'll have a chance to do it again. Yeah, all right. I would, I would expect when I write the next book, because it'll right. be an extension of 12 Rules for Life, I presume. So it's fun Perfect. bumping into you here, because we I just know. bumped into each other at this studio today. You know, yeah, it's actually, we're halfway around the world and yeah. one studio apart. Yeah, but So that's fun. great. So yep. we'll work on the next one, and okay. I'll work on the next Orphan X, and Good. we'll go from there. All right. Good, Good to see, see you, man.